Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 74, Self-Care for the PhD Student. And this vlog comes via request from a colleague of mine, Associate Professor Jackie Hewitt. I've known Jackie for 20 years. We were both little associate lecturers together. And Jackie is one of the truly decent, kind and brilliant people that exist on this planet and certainly in this country. Her research is innovative. She's a fine teacher, a fine supervisor and indeed an outstanding examiner of doctoral students. And Jackie wanted me to deliver or indeed think about delivering a vlog that would confront what she saw as major changes in higher education during our professional lives. The loss of decency, the loss of compassion, the loss of intellectual generosity and the impact of that on our students and on our supervisors. And indeed, the time is right, I think, for a vlog such as this. A lot of reports and refereed articles have emerged in the last year that have been quite distressing and quite disappointing. They include those remarkable studies from Belgium and the Scandinavian countries of the mental health issues of our PhD students. They include this report that explores both sexual assault and sexual harassment in Australian universities and also some pretty shocking blogs with international traction that reports the scale of the intellectual property theft between supervisors and students. And some of those blogs are very disturbing. A few of them I've read and literally I've been in tears at the end of finishing that blog. So there are, as you can see, contextual factors that have led to this vlog today. And it does, I hope, provide a nice match, if you will, with our last vlog on managing disillusionment. Okay, so self-care <laughs> is a phrase that worries me a fair amount because it's a bit hippie for my liking and as you can tell I'm a lapsed goth so lapsed goths really don't have a lot of time for hippie stuff but as always in our professional lives that we've shared Jackie has asked that I be a bit honest and I confront something that might make me a little bit uncomfortable and find the best research to help you out there think through self-care and look, I do think the phrase self-care is relevant and resonant. I think my reticence with it was I assume that supervisors care for students, that that's our role, to look after your well-being, make sure you are okay, and that's our duty of care with you. So self-care is actually less relevant than supervisors caring for you. You know, we hold that intellectual role, but we also hold a personal and social role to enable your progression and enable your career. And yes, sometimes your supervisors are going to have to be very hard on you and when I do that type of work with my students I treat it like ripping a band-aid so I say look I'm about to give you some hard advice I apologize that it's going to hurt here it comes and we're going to talk about how we manage it after I've pulled the band-aid off or indeed waxing if you really want to go there wow mm -hmm. so I tend to preface my comments saying look this is going to be difficult we'll manage the consequences of this difficult conversation so with every iron fist there is actually a leather glove around it so I try and make sure that we understand that the PhD is tough I've always said this to you, we don't dumb down a doctorate at Flinders University, this is tough. If it wasn't a tough experience, if it wasn't difficult, then the PhD wouldn't be worth anything. The qualification is worth something because it is difficult to achieve. So from that type of background, let's get into self-care. And what is self-care? There's some fascinating interdisciplinary definitions that I'm really pretty interested in. The first one I think, as we all know, comes from health sciences and particularly the allied health professions, where it is a regulation of a human function that is under the individual's control. So these involve choices that are deliberate and conscious to enable health. So that means, right, on Saturday morning, if I'm gonna do a 10K run, I don't drink a litre of vodka on Friday night. Self-care says, vodka, no, run, yes. So it is part of self-management and also preventative health, and that's really interesting to me. But the great thing about 
the phrase self-care is it's also used in philosophy where it has explored the care and the development of the self in and through knowledge. So Socrates 101, know thyself. And there's also unbelievably, who knew I'd ever go back there, there's of course some Foucault here. I'm a bit bored by Foucault, I'm an Althusserian, but there is some great stuff with Foucault on self-care, the art of living, art de vivre. His third volume of the history of sexuality in particular worked through the notion of self-care, and it was great work, can I say. So the term brilliantly carries a bit of health science and a little bit of philosophy with it, and together I think that will create an enabling project for our doctoral students. Right. There are a series of proxies in life that suggest things aren't going too well for you. So these are the proxies like mental fog, deep tiredness, exhaustion, fear, stress, short temper. Now the problem with <laughs> those proxies is that's pretty well daily life for a PhD student, nay an academic. So if we're looking for those proxies to diagnose a self-care issue, we'll be waiting a long time. And I think the problem with life is if you are a decent person and all of you out there are decent people, then you tend to park your own interests and your own needs to care for other people. And that means endlessly self-care is second, third, fourth, tenth, on the tier of important things in your life. So what I want to suggest today is how we create these tiny little habit changes that become patterns in your life to provide those micro spaces for self-care. Also remember self-care is not a one-shot deal. You can say, right, well, I'm not drinking a bottle of vodka today, that's self-care, but if you drink a bottle of vodka tomorrow, that's a problem. So it's a series of micro changes that you practice sustainably. That's what we're dealing with today. Now, I really get this. I really understand this intellectually because I've lived a profoundly unbalanced life. And look, I know, all my friends around the world who are watching this vlog are laughing. They are so laughing that, <laughs> and I'm laughing myself, so laughing that I'm doing a vlog on self-care because that's really the equivalent of the Australian Cattlemen's Association coming out in support of vegetarianism. Working in contemporary universities, you know, it's really tough. It's a tough gig. And when I was thinking about Jackie, when we were working together 20, 25 years ago, wow, as a very junior lecturer, and I think about, you know, that was hard work. You know, we worked hard, no days off, we worked on the weekends. But I, I think about the scale of what we're doing now and what Jackie's doing, and in those 20 years, our workloads doubled. There's just no space in life to really do anything. So the contemporary workplace is a pretty tough gig. But what I try and do through my profoundly unbalanced life is to configure a series of structures in it that just compartmentalise, create little spaces where some space and some joy and some interest can emerge. And the reason I do that is the jobs I've had, particularly the last three or four, you know, bad stuff or weird stuff happens every day. And so I have to be intellectually and physically fit. So when something happens in real time, I have the capacity to be able to manage it. If I was tired, exhausted, fearful, a bit teary, I couldn't manage and make the decisions I need to make every single day because resilience is important in these sorts of jobs. So that means life doesn't knock me around too much. When something bad happens, I compartmentalise that and move on with the rest of my life to try and make good decisions. So therefore, self-care is incredibly important to those sorts of structures. And the research focuses on a series of self-care strategies of relevance to you. And I've reified or reduced them down to two M's and four C's. Two M's and four C's. And once we've done those, I'll just finish off with the final component about what the research is saying about self-care and the PhD students. So let's get into the two M's and the four C's. So the two M's are movement and music. 
I have a rule that I have practiced every single day since 1994, that every single day I do some exercise. Every single day I break a sweat and I enjoy the gym, I like going to the gym because I meet people that an academic normally doesn't meet in the course of their life and that's intellectually and emotionally good for me as well. So break a sweat once a day, schedule it like a meeting and do not miss it. And that's why I'm at the gym at 5am because when I arrive at work my time is not my own. Anybody, and all of you do, come through my door and I want to see you. So the chance of me being able to have a lunchtime gym session is just not going to occur because something bad's going to happen at 11.30 and we're going to have to manage it. So find a time that is not broken by the other responsibilities that you have. The second M is music. Now most of you know I write about music, I've written about music for a long time, I play music, played music for a long time. And there's a lot of research that shows the impact of music on the body. Now I'm not talking about the pseudo Mozart stuff, bless, what a mess that is, bless. If you want to do that, that's great. But music does help manage fatigue and music does help build connections between ideas. So for example, I listen to music while I'm writing, it gives my prose a rhythm. So if you haven't written with music and you're having a bit of a writing block, Nat, looking at you, you might like to think about putting on some music and seeing if that creates some different connections in your brain. And also, if you're having a break, whack on the headphones, go for a walk, and you will feel better. Serotonin. There's the two M's, the four C's. Important one this, start a compliments file. So whenever anyone, a student, colleague, staff member, your supervisor, sends you a lovely email or a letter or a card, keep it and file it. And on the days that you're having a bit of a bad trot, pull out that compliments file and feel better. Two, get out of your comfort zone. At least once a day, try and do something really challenging or really tough. Read something really difficult, learn a bit of new software, learn a bit of new hardware, force yourself to learn to gain a new skill. All of us can get stale, particularly in a PhD when we're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. So don't do that. Try and learn something new every day. Get out of that comfort zone. 3C. Make choices. Make choices. Don't allow your life, let alone your thesis, to drift. Force yourself to make choices in your daily life. Make choices and make that into a habit. Particularly, and this is a biggie, make choices about your digital life. Most of you know I'm very digitally active, but you very, very rarely see me with my mobile phone. You know, it's not on my desk, it never is in my desk, I keep it in my bag all day. I play with it about 20 minutes when I'm in the gym in the morning, and that's about all. And I also don't connect my emails to my phone. When I'm sitting at my desk at work, I answer the emails. When I'm away from the desk, I do not. And I never let my analog life be disrupted by my digital life. So that means when you're sitting in my office and talking to me, I'm not checking my phone, I'm not answering phones, I'm not looking at the email, I am with you. Analog relationships tend to become more important than the digital interruptions. Now that's my choice. You can make your own choice. But that's the point. I want you to make cons conscious choices, very important, and don't just say, all oh, right, well, an email's arrived, I'll answer it, or here's a text message, I'll answer it. Start to control your digital and analog life. And my fourth C is control your environment. We all have limitations in our personal and working life. And so what I focus on very strongly is decluttering my space and indeed decluttering my life. Control who enters your space. Most of you know I have a very, very private life in my house. No one comes into my house. Only Steve and I have ever been in our house. So we have a very strong sense of a private life. 
And I also decide who I spend time with and who I don't spend time with. At work we have to, we have to be nice with people, we have to mix with people that probably we wouldn't in the rest of our life. But in the rest of your life, make those choices about the people that you're with are great people, empowering people, interesting people. They're often called radiators. They're the people who radiate positivity and energy. So spend time with radiators. Don't spend time with the drains. The drains are the people that just sap the energy, the light, the happiness out of you. So as you can see, self-care matters a lot to PhD students. It is amazing, I think, that universities around the world are starting to recognise this and they're implementing self-care programs for the PhD students. So a great example is Western in Canada has a whole section of their website on self-care. Brilliant. It, they believe it encourages motivation, but also productivity for their PhD students. And I found a fantastic initiative at the Office of graduate research at the University of Nebraska Lincoln where they get their PhD students to write weekly blogs about how they implement self-care. I think they're terrific initiatives and I know look some of this self-care stuff is a bit bonkers it is a bit hippie for me you know the people that do the all oh, right well before 6 a.m. I do a 10k run I drink tea and then I write in my gratitude journal you know those people bless but you're not doing a PhD Self-care, though, I think, does encourage you to take that moment and to assess your priorities with consciousness. Finding just 20 minutes a day to take a breath, take a walk, listen to some music and send to yourself. And please remember Foucault on this, that self-care is linked up with the quest for knowledge. And this is not selfish care. This is not an individual practicing self-care. This is communities of people practicing self-care. And I think we get a bit confused with this phrase because so many businesses have bought into self-care to make money. So if you just buy the right aromatherapy oil, you go on the right yoga retreat, you buy the right tea, then suddenly you're going to feel better. And that's actually not what I'm talking about today. In fact, probably buying stuff is part of the problem. We need to buy less and learn more. But that's just me. So what I'd ask is we as a Flinders higher education community and indeed all our friends and colleagues around the world who listen to these vlogs, what I ask is we as a community make a decision for self-care, for a nurturing environment for the next generation of researchers. And I just wanted to finish off with a, a really interesting recent paper published at the end of 2015 by Nabil Hazen al Gagori, who titled his great article, Self-Care for the Scientist. I love that, Self-Care for the Scientist. And his recommendations were clear. Connect with family and friends, exercise, have a hobby, disconnect from electronics, sleep, laugh, and structure your day. Fantastic research, very interesting. And yes, all of that I think is very clear. It is, as we all know, harder to do. But my final comments to you all are, don't judge yourself so harshly. All research is this roller coaster ride of excitement and horror, and it's thrilling and it's disturbing and it's worrying and it's fearful and it's terrifying and it's brilliant. That roller coaster is what research is about. That's why you're here. So don't try and moderate the extremes of research. That's what makes it astounding. But what I would ask is you place research in a context. You place research in an environment and that might make a real difference. That we can all do. And as always, I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.